if there are visitors here today, we certainly welcome you. Um, as most of you know, last Sunday we had a candidate speak for a combined service. And there was a lot of discussion, and there was a vote, and uh, he was asked to come and be our next pastor. We have not heard that, but that's uh, good news for the church. Uh, so today you're stuck with me. Uh, he's not here yet. Um, but we do have some announcements, and I also want to let any visitor know, if you're joining us here, you do not have to be a member to partake in communion. Uh, Christ invited believers to partake, and if you're a believer, a first believer, uh, we ask you to join us when we get to the communion. There are three prayer shawls this morning. Uh, Bob Cowan, recovering from a triple bypass, he is doing well, we want to send him. Uh, a prayer shawl, and most of you know how that works. There's a card in front of the prayer shawl. Please sign your card and ask you to pray at least once for the person that is receiving the prayer shawl. Bill Wilcox, a friend of Cheryl Hamilton, is dealing with leukemia. We have a prayer shawl for him. And then uh, Dennis and Betty Marcotte. Dennis is in the hospital with COPD and heart failure. Betty has two types of cancer, including bone cancer. So please stop this morning after the service and, and sign the cards that are back there and, and lift these people up in prayer. Um, um, we want to remind you of the Bible Reading Challenge celebration at Mike and Marin's on Sunday, November 20th. Uh, there was a change in that. It is now a 1 o'clock potluck. Those of you involved with the uh, challenge uh, on November 20th, 1 o'clock potluck. Also, You'll see an insert in your bulletin today, hopefully you have, about church leader nominations. As you know, at our annual meeting in January, uh, we usually have uh, people that are uh, hopefully willing to serve, but we need nominations. So if you have someone that you think would be a good elder, or could be on the finance team, uh, take this home with you, look it over, pray about it, and uh, you can fill it out this morning if you already have names in mind, or bring it back next week. And and I think Brenda has an update on Operation Christmas Child. I do. This week begins the collection for Operation Christmas Child, the 14th through Monday the 21st. There is a sign-up for help. Chris could use lots of help. Do we need, like, cookies and donations? I would like to bring, we don't need a lot usually, but some larger cookies so we can offer those cookies and bring the last Great. If you didn't hear that, ours and cookies, not a lot, but it would be great to have some donations. Thanks. And let's start with the word prayer this morning. Father, we come this morning to worship you. It's, uh, it's an honor, it's a privilege, it's something we do willingly. Lord, everyone here has been touched by you and what you have done for them. So we come, we come to lift uh, your name in praise and song, we come to hear from your word, we come to just enjoy the fellowship with other people. So, Lord, we come this morning praising you, thanking you, and asking you to bless us all. In Jesus' name. Let's sing this song. I will follow.
Well, good morning and thanks for singing with us this morning. We're blessed to have Aaliyah here today playing drums with us. We always enjoy having her here, and especially today. We have a new song for you guys. If you were here uh, before the service started, we sang it for you just to kind of give you an idea of how it sounds. And right now, before we actually go ahead and sing the song, I want to um, kind of practice this little bridge section. I see a generation standing on the truth in each and every nation. God is on the move. Sing that with me. I see a generation standing on the truth in each and every nation. God is on the move. One more time. That was good. I see a generation standing on the truth each and every nation, God is on the move. Oh, you guys got it. Alright, All right, so please stand with us as we sing this song. Join in as soon as you can. And let's sing, God is on the move. 
We don't want for anything. And this communion is a reminder that he's already paid our price. We're dead in our sin, but we can be cleansed because he went to the cross and has suffered in our place. He defends us from our enemies. He corrects us when he needs it. So remember that as we partake of the cup and the bread. He's gone on before us to clear a path for us. He's watching over us. If we are in his sheep path, we need to speak for the light. I'm going to ask you to recite with me the 23rd Psalm before we partake. I think it is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The rod and the staff they come to me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil.
Join me in prayer to pray for our offering. <laughs> Father, how can we thank you for what you for us? You knew us before we were born. And when the day came that we cry out for salvation, you were there to welcome us. Your word tells us every good gift.
continuing our study of John, and we've had some very good lessons. This is lesson number 10 on chapter 10. The book of John was written by the disciple, known as the disciple that Jesus loved. And we really don't have to wonder, well, why did John write this? What was the purpose? Because he tells us himself very plainly in chapter 20. Chapter 20, verse 31 says, These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing that you may have life in his name. So he tells us why he's writing this book. And in so doing, by writing this book, he is doing exactly what Jesus instructed his followers to do before he left earth. John was actively evangelizing to the lost and reinforcing and building up believers. In chapter 10, John continues to write about Jesus' public ministry, his signs, his discourses. Chapter 10 has two main themes. Some of you have read ahead and probably know what they are. The first theme is that Jesus is the shepherd of his flock. The second theme deals with the unbelief of the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders, and some of the Jewish people too. In fact, they were so opposed to Jesus, they just did not want to believe the truth. Uh, they chose not only to not believe, but oftentimes chose to stone Jesus. They tried to kill him. So let's start by looking at the first four verses. Verses 1 through 4 of John, chapter 10. And I know I'm going to get this over the guys because my nose here. So. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Well, there's a few things to review in these first few verses. Jesus is still teaching in Jerusalem, and he alludes to something that happened back in chapter 9 in these verses. Now, two weeks ago, chapter 9 was covered by Lynn Frederick, I believe. I think it was. Jesus talked about the Good Shepherd. He's letting the Pharisees know that even though they were leaders, church leaders, they had little regard for their flock. In fact, if you remember, when the blind man was brought before them, first they didn't even believe it was him. They questioned, are you the one? And when he answered, they didn't want to believe him, so they sent for his parents. Is this your son? Is he blind at birth? And they said yes. When they questioned further, they, they, his parents knew that these people, as Lynn said, had the authority to kick him out of church. He said, don't ask us anymore, ask him. He asked the blind man again. He praised Jesus' name and said he would worship him. Well, that was enough. Think about the irony. The blind man who had not seen from birth, he knew who Jesus was and worshipped him. The Pharisees, the leaders of the synagogue, <coughs> They knew the scriptures, they had heard Jesus preach, but they were blinded to who he was. So a blind man sees, but the church leaders become blind to who Jesus is. Now, the Old Testament teaches of the concept of a shepherd, a royal caretaker of God's people. One passage we just read here in the beginning, the 23rd Psalm. But it's also evident in many other passages, like Isaiah, Ezekiel. Psalm 80, verse 1 says, Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who led Joseph like a flock, who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. So if we look again at verses 1 through 4, let's say through the eyes of someone who was alive at the time Jesus wrote these words, there's a few other interesting details. Cheap hymns of Jesus' time and John's time we're off in a large court or a large field surrounded by walls. The walls were usually made of piled up stones and they were built high enough to keep most predators out, but also to keep the sheep in so they didn't want to away. Now the sheep pen was probably a communal pen. 
Um, a lot of Jewish people had sheep and lambs. Some of them lived in the city, and they didn't have a pasture. Or maybe you were well off enough that you had a lot of sheep, but not enough pasture land. So there would be this communal pen, and you were allowed to bring your sheep into this pen, and then in the morning, your shepherd, one that took care of your sheep, would come to this communal pen and would lead the sheep out for the day to food and water. Inside of this wall pen were probably some gates and smaller pens. The watchman would allow the shepherd in or out with his flock. One reference I came across described the pens as a central boarding area for the flocks. When a shepherd came, he would call his sheep. Now, <laughs> if you had only three or four sheep, maybe they called the sheep by an individual name. Now the shepherd would come into this big pen, and there'd be maybe hundreds of sheep, and he'd say, here Bluffy, here Muffy, here Whitey. <laughs> And he maybe really did. There was only three or four sheep that he had to tend to. But if you had a large herd, it would be pretty hard to call them by name. But what they would do is call with a phrase. Now, not only did the sheep, like, ever, ever, those of you who have dogs, have you ever said something like, want to go for a ride? <laughs> the dog goes nuts. Or want to go for a walk? Well, they know. They know what you're saying. They may not understand English, but they know what you're saying to them. The shepherds tended to the sheep, and when sheep were born, they would be there for the lambing, and, and the sheep would learn their voice. So they may not have called them by individual names, especially if it was a large flock. But when they came in in the morning and said whatever they said, the sheep knew that voice. They knew they were heading to a safe place, and there would be food and water. Another interesting point is to consider that when the sheep heard the voice and they knew it, they followed it. Anybody ever watched an old western on TV? Cowboy shows? Oh yeah. Well, a Palestinian shepherd would not understand what those cowboys were doing on a cattle run. And sometimes, even if you watch long enough of these old movies, sometimes they're actually herding sheep or, or pushing sheep along. You don't see that too often. But the cowboys and the shepherds do not lead their livestock. They drive them. Sometimes they use whistles, yells, gunshots. You see them crack the whip. Sometimes they take their horses and actually bump into the cattle to push them where they want them to go. The Palestinian shepherd would not understand that. He had a rod and a staff usually used to get a wayward sheep back on uh, the path. But he led his sheep. Just think for a moment about the difference between leading and forcing. Jesus came to lead us. He doesn't force us. He doesn't crack a whip. He doesn't have a cattle prod saying, come on, you know what's right. He tells us who he is. He sets an example. And he leads us. Some people choose to follow. Some don't. A good shepherd, like a good leader, has proved his worth, so the flock trusts and follows. Jesus gave several examples. Mark 1, 16 through 20. Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake where they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. He didn't have to convince them. He didn't have to arm wrestle with them. He just said, come. And they did. Verse 19 says, when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed Jesus. They really didn't have to think about it. They didn't analyze it. They didn't say, well, let me ponder this overnight. They just followed it. There was something about Jesus. There was a leadership quality that they could see. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to follow him and began to teach. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax collector's booth. He owned his master. Jesus said, follow me. And Levi got up at once and followed him. 
So when Jesus called these men, they followed. No demand, no threat, no show of force. And you know what? He's still inviting people today in the same gentle way. He's saying, you know who I am. Follow me. Jesus, of course, was telling in John chapter 10, telling the world that he is the good shepherd. He's the gate that offers full salvation. And those that acknowledge and choose to follow him do so. But many chose not to, or they just didn't get it. Look at verse 6 of John chapter 10. Jesus used to figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Now, Jesus is determined. He wants his message to be told, and he wants to tell it. He's determined to explain it so they can understand it. So he says, I am going to speak plainly. Verses 7 through 10. Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate of the sheep. All whoever came before me were thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. That's pretty plain. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus tells them time after time after time that he's the good shepherd, that he's the way. By the way, the thieves and robbers he's talking about here are the Jewish leaders. They couldn't accept Jesus, and they were robbing people of the privilege of knowing him. In verses 11 and 14, Jesus tells them again. And he tells them that he will lay down his life for his sheep, and he will take his life up. So what happens when Jesus again says, I've got to get through to these people? I have to explain to them time and time again what I'm here for, what I'm about. So let's look at verses 19, 20, and 24. When Jesus told them who he was, the Jews did not accept it. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? The Jews gathered around and saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. He's been telling them all along. And they still demand, again, more proof, more proof, more proof. Jesus had an answer for them again. First to review, and then as plainly as possible, he tells them exactly who he is. Verses 25 through 30. I might have to turn around and read this one. Jesus answered them. I did tell you, but you did not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. It's pretty clear he's telling them who he is. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And his last words in this verse, I and the Father are one. So don't you think they get it? 31. What did the crowd say? When he told them who he was, again, the Jews picked up you know, when you ask a question, make sure you really want the answer. I want you to think back, those of you who are older than 30. Most of you probably. Have you ever answered a question based on who was asking it or how it was asked? Here's an example. Maybe if you think back to your youth, you might have been asked a question by a parent like this. What time did you get in last night? Ever happened? Or who were you hanging out with last weekend? 
You knew the answer. You knew what time you got in. You knew who you were hanging out with. Maybe you fudged the answer just a little bit. Well, let me let you in on the secret. Usually when you're asked a question like that, the person asking the question already knows the answer. <laughs> he's not trying to find out if you know the right time. He's trying to find out if you're going to be honest with them. Jesus answered their question. This is an answer with scripture and quotes from their own law. Jesus asked them a question in verse 36. He said, what do you do about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own into this world? Why do you accuse me of blasphemy because I have said I am a God's son? Jesus led an earthly life like no one had ever done. He was sinless in all things. Even as his time on earth came to a close, even when his disciples denied him and fled, he continued to fully accomplish what his father had sent him to do. You know, the last words in chapter 10 could have been said in anger, frustration. The very people Jesus was trying to save wouldn't listen to him, they wouldn't try to understand him. A hundred years ago, when I was in college at River Falls, the very first day of class at a history, in my history class, Professor, I still remember, Professor Smith. And he introduced himself and looked around to see who was in the class, and he said, this class is run by a baseball rule. And we all thought, what is he talking about? He said, in this class, three strikes and you're out. You miss class once, okay, that can happen. You miss class twice, better have a good excuse. If you miss class three times, you either fail or take the class over next semester. There's no bargaining on this. That's how serious he was about his class. Jesus is serious about saving as many people as he can. So he could have reacted like this college professor and said, I told you three times who I am. I'm done with you. He did. I believe the last words he said in this chapter. He said with passion, love, maybe even some pleading. He desperately wanted them to know who he was. They wanted him to accept the truth of who he was. So what was the result of him answering the truth time after time after time? Look at verse 39. Again, they tried to seize him. But he escaped their grasp. There's still two verses in this chapter. So that's not the last verse. But that's what the whole chapter led up to. People not believing Jesus. After this, and we're not sure how he escaped their grasp. It may have been a miraculous escape to somehow walk through them. You don't know. The message in verses 40 through 42 that end chapter 10 read this way. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing. He stayed there, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John said about this man was true. And the last verse, chapter 10, is, in that place, many believed in Jesus. The people in Jerusalem, the leaders of the Jewish faith, didn't get it. They didn't want to get it. So he goes out into the wilderness where John the Baptist taught. And many believe. So I'm going to close this morning with a question. Where are you today spiritually? Are you part of the crowd that just doesn't believe or doesn't care to believe? I hope not. My hope and prayer is that all of us here today are counted as believers in Jesus Christ. That all of us here today recognize and follow the voice of 
our Savior in good shape. I'm going to ask you to stand and before I close the prayer. I'm going to ask you one more time to read the 23rd Psalm. Would you do that? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are not with me. Your rod and your staff may comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup will rejoice. Surely the goodness and love and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Father, chapter, you hopefully have come to understand that you are our good shepherd. You care for us like a good shepherd cares for even the weakest sheep. You explain time and time again who you are and why you came. Lord, we cannot that. You laid down the light for us. And all you ask is to do is to believe and to follow. To do what we know is right. The Lord, we still fail and stumble and fumble. Your forgiveness is so much bigger than our sin. And we thank you for that. Sometimes we forget it and think we're beyond your reach. Your staff. That hook in the end can pull us back no matter how far we fall. Thank you, Lord, for the example you give us in your word. Bless us as we leave here this morning. Keep watching over us. And when you call us by name, I pray that we'll always find you. I pray this to you.